Hello, hello, hello. How is everybody out there doing? Welcome to another Tuesday night sketch off at 4C Comics. As always, uh, I'm joined by uh, the man, the myth, the legend, Mr. Ken, right up here somewhere. There he is, right there. Ken Carson. And then, uh, as you guys can see, hey, say hi, Ken. Hey, hi, Ken. <laughs> and as you guys can see, we're also joined by uh, one of the legendary inkers and artists of, uh, of uh, my time, uh, Mike DiCarlo. How are you doing, Mike? Hello, everyone. I'm glad to make second appearance on the show. Yes, right. I was I was unlucky enough to miss the first appearance because I, I there was something I forget why I had to miss that. I think Annika might have filled in, or Ken just did it all by himself because he's fully capable of doing that. But, no, I don't want to say it was a ranger. I don't it was, yeah, it was a while ago, but uh, yeah, well, I'm yeah. glad I could join this time. Well, so, I'm going to show you how this. Um, is beginning to progress a little bit. Um, oh, yeah. yeah, Mike started off, he was doing a little outlines and some blue lines of some, some headshots and stuff, which we're gonna be uh, offering up some sketch hops tonight with Mike. So well, let's see if, uh, hello, Jason and Jason in the uh, chat. How are you guys doing? It's only Jason's following us tonight. <laughs> All right. Um, this uh, and a third Jason. Wow, that's pretty crazy. <laughs> this uh, particular way of handling drawing with a blue line that is uh, that was given to me by Dick Giordano and a few other guys, Joe Orlando. Um, and now I just, uh, it's kind of my way of thinking. Um, I visualize things with the blue. And then, uh, as you can see, I, I try to get things into place. And then um, I try to make it foolproof so that if it's constructed properly in blue, it uh, it really just doesn't take rocket science to finish it. Uh, oh yeah, no, it, no it, it, it's, uh, it's easy, I would imagine. I I don't I mean to interrupt you, but oh no no, I was just saying it definitely makes it easier. I think that if you if you have a little bit to work with, so you're not just working with a totally blank slate. It gives you you know some structure and a place to good place to go. See, I I, uh, I was lucky enough. I was probably about the last group of guys who came up when the quote unquote old masters, the Gil Kanes, the Kurt Swans, the Ramitas, all those people were still Gene Cullen, they were all still active, Ross Andrew. And uh, you know, I met everybody, Don Heck, every all those guys. I worked with Steve Ditko. And um, what I would do as a young fella in his early 20s is I would just keep my mouth shut <laughs> and listen to everything they said. And I would pick their brains. And those fellows were remarkably patient and generous people with their time, with their guidance. They never acted like well, I mean, I was very respectful, but I mean, they, they never acted like you were a pest. I, the first time I met John Ramita Sr., he just sat down next to me and we talked for like an hour and a half, like we were old friends and I had never met him before. And wow. I just, you know, he picked, I picked his brain and, uh, you know, it was just, um, and I think people from my era, you know, people who were in their 60s and broke in in the late 70s or early 80s. I think they'll all they'll all say the same. That was a uh, a special group of guys. Um, they didn't. I, I'm sure they had tons of pride, or else they wouldn't have done the work they did. But they they didn't have egos. They they were very lacking in ego 
Um, even the couple of times I met Jack Kirby, if you didn't know who he was, he didn't act like he was any kind of a big shot or anything. I mean, that's Jack Kirby, for God's sake. And, uh, you know, that that's... Um, those are lessons that uh, I hold very dear to me. Um, and uh, because... I mean, I, I, I was at a table one time with Jerry Orgway and Mike Zach and Bob Smith and a couple other people. And we were having dinner with Kurt Swan. And he was going on and on about how he was, <laughs> I'm not kidding. He was honored to be with us. And we're like, Kurt, what the heck are you talking about? We're honored to be with you. <laughs> he just didn't, he didn't get what being Kurt Swan was. It was just, it was, um, I mean, this guy was, he was so legendary. And, you know, you just look at back at the volume he did, how iconic, how perfect it was. And I was lucky enough to ink some of this stuff. And the guy had this weird, weird humility about him that uh, we were all just looking at each other. I mean, why is Kurt so humble about his, his achievements? But I, I don't know. Um, but uh, see now at this point, I can take this drawing, uh, let's see. And as you can see, I've, uh, I've uh, sculpted the head. I've sculpted the light source. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's really just an easy matter for me now. I mean, I could I could do it real quick, but just just, just to give you an idea in blue. Well, we did have a claim. I'm just waiting to see what character he wants. Maybe he wants Batman. Jason, you gotta let us know what you want, buddy. Oh yeah, he's got a little bit of a lag, so take him. Yeah. To, uh... Text me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Make it quicker. And if everybody has any questions for Mike, please feel free to just yeah. type into the yeah. comments. Um, I'm used to uh, – I ran my studio, studio out of my home. I had four children, so I was able to uh, focus and – still keep the world world there with me so people talking to me while i work is just not really any big deal uh, <laughs> plus you know all the cons that i've done too which i miss i i hope someday that can be kind of restored again but i don't know uh I don't know what will happen. I don't think anybody does anymore. Yeah. Well, we're trying. Ken and I keep trying to stick our uh, stick our feet in the con. Every single time we get playing on a convention, it's funny because uh, another COVID variant seems to come out every single time. But we're hopeful. <laughs> we're doing we're doing a show in New Orleans in the first week of January, so we're hoping that all this Omicron stuff will be. Uh, will be uh, under control by then, or we'll find out it's not any worse than uh, the Delta variant. We can breathe a sigh of relief, so we'll see. But that's why we're big, we're big on everybody getting vaccinated. We're really big on that here. So, forgive me for being uh, political, and I won't be. But um, I think I just read that six percent of the pop population of the continent of Africa is vaccinated. Yeah. Six percent, hmm. and that's where this newest variant is coming from. Yeah. I'm fully vaccinated. I just booked my booster vaccine. And yet you still have these people who politicize it and they won't get vaccinated. And, you know, we make fun of communist China, but yeah, they are communist and they're, they're harsh, but they got it under control because the government says you have to be vaccinated, period. Yeah. So despite having 1.3 billion people they have 
like 10% of the deaths in this country because we're so, you know, we're just, you know, Americans and you can't tell us what to do. Well, funny, that people, funny that people stop at red lights, though, and things like that. That's okay. Well, it used to be I'm an American and I'll do what I have to do for my country. Yeah. But that's not the case anymore. Now it's I'm an American. I can do what I want. You can't tell me what to do. Right. We've kind of had a shift in our uh, our attitudes. But hey, listen, my daughter posted something on Facebook. I thought it was hilarious. She said, some of y'all are getting a, a science book for Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it, it's very frustrating. And um, it's amazing how militant some people are when you when you suggest that they just get va- just get vaccinated. Mm. You know, mm-hmm. but the worst you're going to have a sore arm for a day or two it's, it's, yeah. it's well deep. speaking of sore arms um, Andy Matthew wanted to ask you how your shoulder's doing well uh, <laughs> I'm using it I, I uh, even the surgeon when he opened me up couldn't believe how much damage I had done I mean I mm pretty much destroyed my shoulder. So I had to have complete reconstructive surgery on it. But um, fortunately, it never interfered with the physical use of my hand. Uh, And I I go to therapy like three times a week. And I appreciate I appreciate somebody asking. But uh, yeah, uh, not not what was needed, but we can't always plan how life goes. So um, anyway, I'm just gonna give you another. Sure. Another yeah, show. Mr. Uh, Victrola, we're still waiting to find out what character you want. Uh... Yeah, I just sent him a message. Yeah. Oh, Jason. That would work better. Yeah, Jason. He wants to get something from you, but he uh, hasn't picked a character. Let's see. Okay. Well, Tom Jason. Yeah, I, I owe Jason yeah. drawing us. <laughs> yeah. He, uh, he, well, he would like you to draw either a Raza Ghoul or a Ghost Rider. Your choice, sir. So. All right. That'll be, that'll be your first sketch. Raza Ghoul as Ghost Rider. <laughs> no, not as Ghost Rider. Come on, Ken. I right, listen. Everybody else is Ghost Rider. Why not Raza Ghoul? <laughs> um. Yeah, let me just uh, nick in a couple of last things. Um, as I said, don't 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 feel funny about talking to me while I'm doing this. Oh no, you're good, sir. So there you go, Jeff. What what what, what amalgamation of Ghost Rider and the DC? If Ghost Rider could be one, a DC character, which well, who would he be? be? I mean, who would he who be? Would be? Um. Green Lantern? Ghost Rider. I, mean, I think they kind of did that. Like, they did something in the – you never read that series. There was the uh, – I, I said the you know, Forever Evil. There was like a there was like an evil Justice League, and mm-hmm. there was a guy who looked – I'm trying to think of what he was. I feel like he had a skull for a face, and he was um, – I can't remember who it was. I'll have to, I'll have to look. Maybe somebody in the um, – uh, somebody in the chat can. Oh, here somebody said, "Imagine, imagine Lobo is Ghost Rider." Oh, well, God. they got the motorcycles. All right. Uh, yeah, yeah, and I, 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 I could just see Lobo randomly giving everybody pen stairs just because he can. <laughs> well, all right. Well, uh, well, I can throw the prices up for the sketches again, would you? There it this is. is uh, see, this is the next stage. If you can see it now, mm-hmm. uh, there we go. As you can see, with with blue, I mean it's all there. And mm-hmm. uh, to take it from here to a finished ink is the easy part, actually. This sure. Is, you know, you could see the uh, the light source and and uh, the mood, the uh, angle of the head, and uh, you know the basic composition. I mean, I have. Uh, this this I am happy to turn into a finished pencil for someone or a complete ink. Um, 
but I, I just want to at least show that process. And, and I have one other one laid out and uh, give me like five seconds to resharpen this. Sure, sure. And then we can get started on your um, Raza Gold Make Rider. Just need to hold us up, buddy. We were just, we were just chit chatting. No worries. Yeah, this is going to be a fun, casual show tonight, guys. We're just going to hang out with Mike. We're going to talk to him. A lot of some artists, like Mike, I don't know if you know this, but Jerry Ordway is, is, is as great a guy as he is, and he's so full of stories, and he's so nice. The man cannot chew gum and walk at the same time because every time you have a conversation with him, he could be literally signing his name, and if he wants to answer you, he stops, and he looks up, and he talks. He can't, like, draw and talk at the same time. It's pretty crazy. But so we're very happy to have somebody on who can do both. <laughs> um, in all honesty, though, because of my shoulder injury, uh, I have to be very careful with doing finished artwork because, see, I have my desk at a certain angle and height and I have my chair raised, so mm -hmm. I can kind of just lay it down. Right. So, I mean, I can do some rough rough stuff here and talk and answer as many questions as you'd like but um for me to to actually do finished pieces while we're talking uh my shoulder has precluded me from being able to function that way uh, sure. unfortunately um i have about uh another month's worth of rehabilitation and then it will uh, be somewhat back to normal uh, yeah when I when I fell I knew <laughs> I knew it was bad because I couldn't even a neighbor asked me how what was wrong and I couldn't even talk it, it mm -hmm. felt like somebody shot me uh but anyway i'm doing a uh once again I'll, I'll just give you the quick and i tend to do the the classic silver age not not that i care i do anything anybody wants but uh this is just a, a captain america laid out well, let's see if Ken can blow that up. Hold on a second. Let's see. Yeah. There we go. Oh, yeah. I totally see it with the star in the back. Nice. So I mean, uh, that's that's the uh, it's the same principle as Batman. Uh, just get it structured. Put in the light source. Get the uh, get the geometry sound. And uh, the old timers would be proud of me, I guess. <laughs> um, you know, what's the funny thing is, uh, you think people like like Kirby as stylized as he ended up becoming by the mid to late sixties. You think somebody like Kirby didn't follow any of these rules, but. If you look at Kirby from a little earlier, the earlier 60s or the late 50s, you can see that he was schooled in just the same classical way those guys all were. He just had the, the creative courage to take it one more step and just kind of redefine the look of comics. But... It cracks me up when people say, oh, Jack really couldn't draw. Yeah, Jack really could draw. He just he just had his own world, and he didn't want to follow the rules anymore. And he yeah. didn't have to. He didn't have to. By the mid-'60s, I mean, he was doing stuff that was just undreamed of. And uh, I was fortunate enough to be a young fella, I started collecting Marvel around 62, just as I was starting to read. 
And that explosion with him and Ditko, who I think is one of the most underrated artists of all time. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I was there at the uh, at the inception of, uh, and Don Heck, Don Heck was a very underrated artist also, and a very nice man. And Dick Ayers, uh, boy, what they did. And uh, you know, hey Mike, I, can I show you one of my favorite comics that you inked? Can you show me one of your what? One of my favorite comics that you inked. Yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> now I bring that up because um, uh, we actually represent Bill Morrison, and uh, I know uh, you did a tremendous amount of inking work for Bongo. Yeah, I did uh, oh God, you know, at least 15 years worth with Phil Ortiz. 15 years. Actually, Bill, 15 years. Yeah, Bill um, was the one who kind of helped get me into, into Bongo, like around 1999 or 2000. Mm -hmm. So uh, he's a very talented artist, and he was very – very helpful and encouraging to me. And uh, if and when you you see Bill, tell him that I said hi, and I appreciate you know what he what he did for me. Uh, yes, sir, well, I talk to him at least two or three times a week. So yeah, he's uh, and boy, did, he was. Uh, you know, I think. Matt Groening wishes he could draw The Simpsons as well as Bill Morrison could. <laughs> you know, I'm sure Matt wouldn't be too happy for me to say that, but uh, well, it's funny. I have um, I have a piece that I actually got from Bill um, where he drew it like Matt Groening. <laughs> yeah, here, yeah, here, all right, yes, yeah, Lo, this is great. So this is definitely some Tracy Ullman Simpson stuff right here. Look at this. So Bill drew this, but he drew it in yeah, yeah, that's it. the Matt Groening style. <laughs> <laughs> you know what Matt's uh, father's name was, right? Mm -mm. Homer? Really? Yeah. Homer? Yeah. Figures. You know, Homer, Homer Groening was a huge entity in Madison Avenue. He was a big, big star in uh, – in Madison Avenue in the late 50s and 60s. Uh, I'm not saying that's why Matt got anywhere, but uh, mm -hmm. Homer Groening was a very big name for a long time. Uh, so Matt comes from, from famous and good stock. That's for sure. Uh, but as I'm... Uh, Moving along here. Sure. So you mostly eat Phil Ortiz when you were at Bongo? Yeah, I mostly worked with Phil. And uh, when I, I was was seeing Phil fairly often at shows when back in the good old mm -hmm. pre-pandemic days, and uh, he would always go on and on. Uh, oh, I never want anybody but Mike DeCarlo to ink my stuff. <laughs> he was very nice about it. But uh, I'm going to hold it up again. And just to show you that it's just a matter of uh, where are we at? See, so, yeah, I've just tightened the layout a bit. And mm -hmm. I'll do the same thing I did with Batman. I just, uh, when you throw in the light source, all of a sudden, it becomes uh, very easy to work with. And those two pieces are available if anybody wants to. Yeah. You know, yeah Charles, said, a I would uh, be, be happy to finish them as a really tight pencil, or I'll be happy to ink them. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, but this was just to 
give people an idea of, um, I guess I don't know how else to say it, but this is, is how I was able to work from one company to another company to another company. Um, just, just learning the geometry and, uh, boy, I tell you, you can ask Bill Morrison, nobody was more finicky about the perfect structure of the Simpson characters. I mean, Bill will vouch for that. I mean, uh, that company taught me, that company taught me a lot of discipline because if you were even slightly off, like Bart's nose or, or one, one loop too many in Marge's hair, I mean, boy, they were on it. And they yeah. had editors who were really good artists and they would, you know, they'd say, Mike, you know, uh, you know, it, it, uh, you're a little off on this or a little off on that. So, um, it built you know, on I, the, I used to, uh, if you don't mind, I don't mean yeah. to keep talking on, but I, I did a lot of the, uh, I guess special projects or company artwork for uh, Marvel, Disney, DC, the stuff that would go on the video games and mm -hmm. t-shirts. And um, that's when I, I had to start learning uh, Illustrator and Photoshop. But, uh, <laughs> you know, it was, uh, I guess my, my whole latter part of my career has been um knowing how to try to be kind of perfect it's uh you know it was very demanding and uh but you know what there is no level of personal discipline that will ever let you down um i'm glad i worked for the uh, the people I did, and I'm glad they were as tough on me as they were, because um, it made me set a personal standard for myself that to this day I, I won't ever go back on, and um, I. Uh, Matter of fact, I'm going to show you very, very quickly. <laughs> sure. I'm doing a uh, a graphic novel for uh, these uh, <laughs> obviously very well off restaurant tour uh, owners in. Uh, their headquarters is Monaco, if I can give you an idea. <laughs> but uh, this is um, my my pencil and ink uh, mm -hmm. up there. I don't know if I can move this farther back, but uh, you know these yeah, are their these are their characters, and uh, that's all my personal storytelling. All my Pencil inks, um, and uh, you know that's that's a challenge. It, it's a challenge for me, and uh, I mean to keep disappearing. Uh, <laughs> Do you like uh, doing uh, storyboards and you know laying out the, the the pages like that? I'm sorry. You like doing page layouts and. You know, yeah, actually, um, people wonder why I'm not more, uh, I don't know what the word is. Uh, I don't take more pride in the inking that I did over the years. I think in actuality, I was always a frustrated penciler. <laughs> <laughs> and... Uh, 
that's why in the last several years, I just really don't. I've been offered ink work, but uh, it's just it's just not something I want to do anymore. Um, I I don't mean to be a snob or anything, but uh, you know the been there, been there, done that. I, I just uh, I really like starting with a blank page now, and uh, but anyway, this is. Uh, Essentially, the uh, now at this point, I can take this Captain America and uh, let's see. You know, it's all there, and I can. Uh, as I said, I'm I'm very happy to. Uh, Turn it into a finished pencil, turn it into an ink for someone. Um, now, I also, uh, I also have no problems with uh, anybody's uh, flights of fancy. Uh, you know, I'd like... Uh, Batman and Superman to be doing something outrageous in some outrageous situation. I, I have no, uh, I have no problems with uh, anybody's, no matter how offbeat the idea is. I, I, I enjoy that stuff. Um, so, uh, I don't know. So I've somebody asked you what, crazy questions about to draw something, you don't mind doing it? Because that's a question we like to ask a lot of creators. What's the wildest thing somebody ever asked you to to commission that you, you, you said no to? Sounds like you might not say no. <laughs> um, well, I have certain guidelines. I, I won't draw anything that shows any kind of cruelty to uh, children or animals or old people. Uh, I will work around a female nude, but uh, maybe I'm showing my, my age. I I don't do male nudes. Um, I I don't draw sexual acts. Um, not that I'm the world's biggest prude, but I mean you have to have certain areas that you just don't want to go to. I don't want to attract that element who is into pornography or, or anything else. I'm sure people probably pay a fortune for that kind of stuff, but uh, I, I just don't, I just don't want to do that. Um, sure. You can draw the line wherever you want to. That's the good thing about, you know, making your own rules is, you know, wherever, whatever you're comfortable with, do whatever you're not, you don't. That's it. You don't really have to explain it to anybody. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm happy to draw somebody's cat or dog or you know, it doesn't matter to me. Um, <laughs> but I had a couple other things here. Uh, I have stuff all over the place. I'm right here. Uh, oh. <laughs> speaking of Bill, speaking of Bill Morrison and the Simpsons, uh, I mean, this is stuff I created from scratch. Did the coloring. Can blow that one up real quick. Look at that. <laughs> I know, look at that. So. Uh, you know, is that for Bongo? Excuse me? Was that for Bongo? No, that was somebody who wanted a commission. And uh, I'm also not adverse to doing almost like painting oh, kind of things. Wow, oh, that's gorgeous. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm I'm very adventurous. I, 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 I like doing anything. And uh, was that watercolor? 
Well, that's uh, computer watercolor. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I also, I can do it by hand also. Um, that I made prints of and uh, would sell them at cons. But uh, my goal in life is to meet Gal Gadot, but I don't know if that'll ever happen. Uh, <laughs> it's got to be at the right con at the right time, I guess, right? Yeah. Uh, I'm sure she's uh, extremely interested in meeting nearly 65 year old men. Uh, but um, Mike's favorite DC villain. Do you have a favorite? Probably, probably the Joker. There you go. Because. Um, his, his insanity almost makes him beyond beyond evil. Just like Galactus is beyond moral judgment because he's Galactus, the Joker is so insane that as evil as he is, you almost don't see him as evil. You almost pity the level of insanity that group that controls his life and that's why he's he's so the depth of the joker always fascinated me he's so multifaceted in in his personality uh so i would say the joker is probably um did you uh you know, I, I'm. I don't know how much else I can do here. As I said, I'm a little limited. Sure. Uh, well, I guess that we can. We'll, we'll, what we're going to tell people is that we're going to. We'll take a little bit of a list if some people would like. Mike was more than happy to take some. He's a little limited in what he can do. So if anybody wants either one of the two pieces he already has sort of started, there's a Batman, there's a Captain America. He can do those in pencil for eighty dollars, or finished inks for a hundred, or. Like we already got Jason Victrola wanted you to do your choice, either a Ghost Rider or a Ra's al Ghul. Not to be confused with a Ra's al Ghul as Ghost Rider, Ken, who's trying to make it do something <laughs> super weird. But um, yeah, you can, if you want to do that one at a later time, you're more than welcome to do that one. We, we don't want to make, we want to make sure we keep your arm in good shape so we don't want you hurting yourself. But we can take a little yeah. bit of a list. We can take a little bit of a list live off of our pricing for tonight. Uh, for Mike and uh, and we're also probably going to try and do a little uh, something. Mike's was telling us about some of the other different um, artworks that he does. Sometimes he'll do cover recreations, which you can see. I think if I can get Ken to rip his off the wall, K Ken has an insanely great cover recreation that uh, that you did for him. I know you got some there too, Mike. Yeah. This is one Ken got from you that uh, you know a lot of people would be jealous of if they saw this. Check this one out. This is this is uh, off the wall. Off the wall. Check it out. Look Literally. At Look at that. Yeah, That's in the family. And, and it's there's no overlay. He literally inked every letter. Right he does there. all the yeah. He does all the pencils yes. and all the wording himself. Yeah, yeah. There's no there's no paste ups or anything. It's all hand done. Mm -hmm. uh, and that yeah. typeset, that typeset lettering is uh, is uh, not easy to do, <laughs> but I manage. Um, and then Mike was showing yeah, us. He was I, showing I, us. I, Justice, you showed us that Justice League annual you did for uh, your creation that uh, you and Chuck Patton worked on. That was yeah. the piece. right here. Uh, yeah, somebody. <laughs> I'm embarrassed. Somebody, somebody asked me to recreate this, and I'm looking at it, and I'm saying, "Why does that look familiar? To, <laughs> familiar to me?" And then, <laughs> then I saw it was signed by me and Chuck Patton, and it's got to be from like 1985 or something. And no wonder why I missed it. But anyway. Yeah, that's a listen. That that's a that's that book's worth a little bit of money. The character with the star on his chest is a, uh, uh, I think he's Colonel she uh, Steel or uh, and then uh, Vixen. That was their first appearance. Was in that book. Yeah. 
So yeah, there's two characters who made their first appearance in that book that you there did the cover of. That's nice. See, the funny thing is, people will at cons or something and say, "Do you remember 1983 when you?" Did? It's like, oh, <laughs> oh, I, I, I don't remember what I did in 1983. Uh, I don't remember a specific page or something, but uh, you know, it's almost frightening. To think of uh, how long ago that stuff really was, and um, I was very fortunate to be, I think, in the last really true devoted comic readership decade, which was the '80s, because um, in the '90s, between the internet and the proliferation of video games, uh, social networking uh comics starting to becoming excessively high high priced uh you know you saw books that were selling three or four hundred thousand copies a month they were starting to sell fifty thousand copies a month and uh i think nowadays if you sell 35 or forty thousand copies a month it's considered uh, you know a very good selling book when when i was doing batman in the late 80s i mean that book was selling like a half a million copies a month yeah uh and uh I, i'm very fortunate to have been been part of that really um and uh yeah that time in the 80s uh I miss it was uh, comic comics were just bursting and uh, there was there were the uh, people who were around my age or a little younger who were still active and they were still doing great work and there was the newer guys like Ordway and Michael Golden and you know who were doing great work and the guys a little before that George Perez who were doing great work and it was just such a amazing collection of talent I'm, I'm not naming the writers i don't feel competent in naming all the good writing in that time too but it was such a, a conflux of of just the old the medium the new just an amazing talent coming together and uh you know, I, I was very fortunate to have been a part of it. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. You definitely were. Like I said, this is one of this. I got. I had Mike do this piece for me a couple of years ago, which is just one of the prizes of my collection. It was a great, uh, one of my favorite scenes from the Death in the Family miniseries was uh, Superman and Batman coming to blows. Well, I just, I, I love the bottom where it's, where it basically, you know, Superman uh, tells him he just bruised his knuckles, and then uh, you know, and he's like, "You're lucky I rolled with that punch, or you could have been, you could have crippled yourself." I'm like, "That, yeah, it's yeah, pretty, that was pretty poignant at the time." <laughs> yeah, that was. Uh, is there a character you haven't drawn that you would like to draw? Uh, <laughs> I think I've I don't think there's a character I haven't drawn I, <laughs> I, I don't even mean to be facetious about it but uh, either in the business or for a commission I don't think there's anybody I haven't drawn uh, at least once I will be upfront and say my least favorite and maybe it'll lose me some work. My least favorite is the swamp thing because it violates everything that I talk about. It's not really, <laughs> it's so organic and, you know, leaves and twigs and vines and, you know, rights. And then those people were magnificent at it, but it just, it kind of boggles my mind. I can't, uh, I can't come quite to grips with the swamp thing. 
I've done a lot of them and people are happy, but it's it's like pulling teeth. <laughs> monsters because they can make mistakes and uh, no one will notice <laughs> yeah. right oh, there's one tweet too many there yeah right exactly it's, that's why yeah Tommy McFarlane used to say he always loved watching drawing spider-man in rubble because you can't mess up rubble it's rubble it's you know no one's gonna be like exactly like that bricks out of place oh no look at that rock why is it there you know it's that darn yeah, torn down and then most people don't they don't like to draw buildings vehicles things like that uh, no, how do, what do you i like doing that kind of stuff <laughs> yeah. that's weird. i take pride in doing uh well i mean i grew up on jack and i mean there wasn't a device machine a cityscape a vehicle that uh, I understand he was a, a real student of, uh, of actual mechanicals and the way things worked. And if you really look closely at a lot of Jack's machinery, you could see kind of how it would work. That was the brilliance of the guy. Yeah. And uh, I, I, I think he... He subscribed to popular mechanics or stuff like that. Mm. I, I remember reading about it that Jack would really, he would really learn how machines functioned in the most intricate manners, and that's that's the reason why all the weapons and the vehicles and everything just was. Uh, Jack always felt like he wanted to be an architect. Well, I mean, the cityscapes he did were just amazing, futuristic, whatever. It was just, uh, and, and the three-point perspectives on them and mm -hmm. stuff. Uh, yes, Jason, so that's what you want me to do, huh, the motorcycle? <laughs> <laughs> I, think you just got, I think you just got a headshot, but uh, you never know. You may want to upgrade to something with a motorcycle. <laughs> no, I, I owe him a... Uh, a Spider-Man in the Goblin drawing. So wow. uh, Jason has been very patient with me, and I appreciate it. Uh, but I'm at the point now where I can lift my arm without it being too painful. So uh, as I said, I, I would do more finished stuff if I could have arranged my drawing board to be there so I can rest my arm. But uh, pretty soon it'll be back to normal. Um, but anyway, uh, I am not in a hurry to leave, but I don't necessarily want to keep you guys. No, no, no. We're uh, fine. We like, we like, we, you know, one of the things that people like to talk about are the processes, uh, you know, stories that, you know, uh, love to hear the stories from back in the day, uh, you know. Uh, well, one of my one of my favorite stories to tell is uh, must have been like eighty one or eighty two. I was asked to go to a uh, a lunch, and at the lunch was Kurt Swan, Don Heck, John Ramita, mm. Dick Ayers, uh, Joe Orlando. Wow. Uh, a whole bunch of these guys and I'm like 24 years old and I'm sitting with these guys and I'm saying, what, what am I doing here? With these guys? <laughs> it was, you know, I, I just felt like, I felt like I didn't belong, you know, with, with these yeah. guys, but they were all so nice. You know, nobody treated me poorly, but, uh, they, they were very, very, very much gentlemen. And uh, as I said, the, the lack of ego on these guys. I was petrified to meet Jack Kirby when I met him a couple of times. Well, the first time. And he was just the sweetest, nicest guy. And he looked you in the eye and he, he, he really listened to everything you said. And... I wonder if he knew 
what it was to be Jack Kirby. I, I, maybe he didn't. Maybe he didn't know what it meant and how many thousands of people he influenced. Uh, I'm gonna guess no. I, Jim Shooter tells a story about Jim Shooter. We did we had we did Jim Shooter on the show, and above him he had a, a big picture of uh, a, a sketch of uh, uh, Captain America, done by Kirby. And he told us a story how he got it. He was actually at a, a Comic Con, and they were auctioning this piece off. And the guy who walked you, the, the auctioneer basically started the bid at $100. 50 and he said nobody $50. Was, 50, 50. Nobody yeah, was bidding it. So Jim bought it. And he just he yelled. Gave, he, he oh, yeah. Back well, he yelled. Said, he yelled 200. Just, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He said he was going to pay whatever it cost because he was not going to let this piece go for, for any. You know. So he, and then when he finally got it, he gave it back to Jack and he said, you Don't ever give your art away like this. This is too good. And Jack told him to keep it, and, and Jim didn't want to keep it, so Jack took it out of his hands and signed it to Jim Shooter, <laughs> and handed it back to him. And he's got it hanging on his wall ever since. Yeah. So it's one of those things where people just didn't. They, there was another person's art, I guess, who was going in, and and uh, what Shooter had said was, is he was like, I, I'm not going to let Jim, like uh, Kirby's art go for less than the than this other artist's art. Mm -hmm. And he's just and he said I didn't have any money at the time, but what I had was a credit card. And I was willing to put however much money on that credit card it took to make sure that piece. And he, he said two hundred dollars when the bid was at fifty. And the auctioneer was like, was like, we're not, we don't even need to get any other bids. Jim wants that. And he was like, sold. And Jim was like, no, I want people to bid on this because it's so great. But he ends up he still to this day he has it. And it's, every time we talk to Jim, it's hanging right behind him. And it's a beautiful, larger than life Captain America by. It's probably you know, sixteen by twenty. It's huge. Oh yeah. And I mean, of course, now people, you know, know what mistake they made. And that thing would be worth tens of thousands of dollars now. And he had to basically bid it up from $50 to get mm -hmm. people to do it. So, yeah. You know, um, I know this for a fact that uh, when, when did Steve Ditko die? About two years ago? Uh, 2000, no, it was 2009 or 10. Steve no, 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 I'm sorry. I was thinking of Dick Giordano. No, you're right. 2000, um, 2019, 2019, I think, or 20. Right, 19, I, I think. I think we're I know that um, maybe around 2007 or 8, uh, somebody in Canada was running a really big show, and they offered Steve Ditko a quarter of a million dollars just to, to come, you know, sign his work, appear at a panel. He turned it down. Hmm. He, well, I don't know if you know that much about Steve, but he was, uh, he was quite a character. Uh, he was a recluse. Yeah, but I mean, you couldn't entice him with money. I mean, you offer anybody a quarter of a million dollars, they're going to, you know, they're going to go on a scooter to go there, but uh, it didn't mean anything to him. Uh, oh, yeah. He didn't care. I mean, he was also like, he, he, I think he felt from what I, when I know of the man, he felt like the work that he did was work for hire. He did it. It's over. He got paid for it. And that's it. He was a very black and white person. It was either, it, there was no gray. It was either you were this or you were that. That's why he liked drawing the question. That's why that was one of his favorite things to do is because that character did not live in the gray. If you broke a law, you were bad. If you were good, you didn't break a law. And that was like, that was that, you know, that how he was as a person. Yeah. So he, yeah. he would never take money for Spider-Man because he didn't, he didn't deserve any money for Spider-Man because he was already paid for it. Well, two, two quick Ditko stories because now I, I remember them. Yeah. Uh, Dick Jordan and I were, were very close. He, he was uh, like a second father to me. But he was telling me uh, at one time, uh, I guess or late 65, early 66, Dicko was starting to get really pissed about not getting plot credit on Spider-Man. So Dick was one of the uh, managing editors at Charlton. So he went to go visit Steve to entice him, you know, come to Charlton, 
you could plot whatever. Uh, and you know, and Dick would have no reason to lie. He, he said, you know what was on Steve's drawing board when I came to visit? The panel where Spider-Man is lifting off that huge metal machine that he had been trapped under when he was fighting Dr. Octopus, one of the most iconic pages in comic book history. He says that, I remember looking at that page and thinking, you know, how powerful it was. I said, Dick, do you realize you were, that's probably one of the most, the 10 most famous pages in the history of comic books. And uh, that happened to be on Steve's board that day. Wow. early 66 or late 65 but the other Ditko story is uh, I originally broke in as Dick's assistant in 1979 and one day he said because he was an editor up there he said why don't you come up to DC we have an extra drawing board you can sit there and you know hang out and get the get the feel of it so I'm sitting there and I'm doing some background work for Dick. And this guy walks in, very unassuming, uh, a gray, not overly clean overcoat, uh, very, very, uh, I don't want to say hobo looking, but I mean, just the most unassuming person you'd ever see. And he, he talked very quietly. And I didn't listen to him. He didn't seem like anybody. But Dick had a reverential way of talking to him. And so when the guy left, I said, Dick, why are you talking so nice? I, 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 I hate to say it. I said, why are you talking so nice to that bum? <laughs> he said, bum. He said, do you know who that was? I said, no. He said, that was Steve Ditko. Hmm. <laughs> you got to be kidding me. Oh, my God. So, you know, I was in the room for 20 minutes, and he was talking to Steve Ditko, and I just thought it was like this guy just off the street maybe looking for a job or something. But that's my first memory of Steve Ditko, yeah. uh, which is amazing. Uh Was there, was there ever a, a page or, or story pages? That came across your desk for you to ink that you just looked at the art and were blown away by it? Well, one of the very first things I was asked to do, Dick Giordano and I did it together. This was in very early 1981. Was the Batman Hulk team up? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Dick did all the Batman stuff and I did all the Hulk stuff. Not necessarily known. So all the Bruce Banner and all the Hulk stuff is my inks. Plus a lot of the backgrounds. But who is the penciler? Jose Luis Garcia. Garcia Lopez. So um, I, I'm looking at this stuff. And I said to Dick, I said, I can't, I can't ink this stuff. It's, it's too good. I said, all I'm going to do is wreck it. That's it. I literally and, have it right here. This is the, uh, it. it's the oversized. Yeah. So now, so now I've got, I've got Jose Luis Garcia Lopez's autograph on it. Now I know I need your autograph on this piece too. But as I said, I, I would, as I'm looking at the pencils, I, I said to Dick, I, I said, I don't want to touch this stuff. I said, <laughs> I'm going to destroy it. I said, this stuff is just too good. And Dick said, Mike, I feel the same way. We all feel the same way. You can't, you can't improve or even match what Garcia Lopez does. He said, just ink it the best you can. He said, that's all, that's all any of us do. We're, we're all just, uh, you know, the guy, and he wasn't even that old then. He was probably 30 or 32. But, right. uh, you know, that was... Uh, that was one of the very first exposures I had to, 
you know, really sinking in and doing work. And it was like, oh my God, if everybody is this good, what the hell am I doing here? <laughs> but turns out that just about nobody was as good as him. So <laughs> I'll tell you, you what, I, uh, Look at that. yeah, that's me. That's me. Look at that. Very Brusema. Yeah, this is the only time Jose Luis ever drew the Hulk, and it was just – it's one of my favorite Hulks. I, I just I think it's – and it's probably because of your inks on it. I don't know. It's just uh, – it. The guy is uh, – I don't know. He's blessed with a gift that, I don't know, one out of a billion people. Yeah. You're right, Jason. He, he – he basically intimidates everybody. He's just he's just so good. He used to do all of DC's special projects artwork. He did he did all of it. He was just so good. The most beautiful Wonder Women, Wonder Woman's and, and stuff. But uh, you know who's one of my personal favorites and that I don't think I mean he's given tons of credit, but I was always a huge Gil Kane fan. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, you know, he did the Adam and Green Lantern and stuff for DC, and then he, he came on to Marvel. But, uh, and I, I ended up inking a lot of Gil Kane, and uh, I think he did Tarzan for newspaper strips, but. Uh, Gil Kane was a fantastically talented. Matter of fact, one of my favorite teams of all time was Gil Kane inked by John Romita. Wow. Those were like my favorite Spider-Man. Those were just Gil Kane's incredible composition and angles. And then Romita would just bring it together with that super solid, beautiful inking because he was a, a great artist too. But I have all... I still study that stuff to this day. I, I study that stuff all the time. I, mean, I have you, the Gil Kane um, IDW artist edition. I wonder if there's any inking in there from Romita. But they were a hell of a team. And uh, I tell you, Wally, Wally Wood over Jack Kirby was just another. Just absolutely amazing. Uh, yeah, you're listening. You're right about the like, you know, Gene Gene Cullen. Do you ever do you ever work with him at all, or do you ever uh, talk to Gene? Yeah, I got I got to tell you that uh, two of the hardest people I ever found to be, uh, and that's why I respect Frank Giacoya so much. I found Gene Cohen and Kurt Swan very difficult to aim because there was a. Uh, oh, yeah, that was a Gil Kane. Look at that. Just, Ink by Ramita. Yeah. Beautiful, 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 beautiful. Yeah, look at that. I mean, just the, the black and white composition, just, oh, just amazing stuff. But um, I was saying about Kurt Swan and Gene Cohen is they had, even though it was strong and powerful and dynamic and beautiful, there was a, a subtlety, a certain softness in the way they graded and shaded and uh, you had to be really careful that you didn't either underpower it or overpower it. And uh, I tell you, Frank Giacoya is one of the most underrated inkers of all time. And I know I'm going to get people to hate me for this, <laughs> but I actually think he inked Kirby better than Joe said it. I, I'm sorry. I know people are going to say, is he nuts? But uh, I think Joe, as amazing a talent as he was, put 
a little more of himself into it than Giacoya did. I think yeah. Giacoya was a little more faithful to what Kirby did. He kept Jack. <laughs> Hold on, I gotta get my I gotta get my hawk going. Hold on. Can I <laughs> Mike, do you know yeah. David Williams? Uh, David Williams is the is the bro hawk. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, buddy. There you go. So there you go. Um <laughs> cut his mic. Oh my gosh. Um yeah, I was going to say, uh, uh, I know. Well, listen, I, I couldn't agree with you more. I think that um, I think that I love I love Sinet's stuff on Busema. I think they were a perfect team, but I do. I, I think that he he was, you know, Kirby's pencils were so they were just they, they didn't. That there are incredible inkers out there, but sometimes their inking styles just conflict a little bit with the pencils. And I agree. I don't I don't I don't know if 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 Joe was. Uh, don't don't get me wrong. I mean, great. on a scale yeah. of one to ten, Joe was nine point five. Mm -hmm. I just think Giacoya was ten. There you I go. Mean, it, it, I I couldn't even begin to 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 debase Senate's country. Oh no, never. Um, matter of fact, I talked to Neil Adams one day, and I think Joe inked the Thor that Neil did. And Neil was like, amazing. It was like, this is this is what a Marvel comic should look like. So Neil was was thrilled that uh, that Joe Joe inked him on a Thor. It was right after Kirby left, I think. But uh, there you go, Mike. There's a nice pure Joe Sinet. All Joe. Yeah, I mean just. From 1970, yeah. Just saw it was. I mean, Joe was as solid as a rock. I mean, I, I really no <laughs> no death threats. I I, I <laughs> love Joe Sinnott. Uh Mike Royer was Joe, Jack's best thinker. I think Jack felt that because Mike was uh, was. It, incredibly faithful to Jack and Jack appreciated it, especially after, you know, Vince Coletta took a few too many liberties with, with Jack, but, uh, yeah, Mike's a very talented artist period. And, uh, I think he, uh, he was great for Jack. Um, but, uh, see, I, I'm a Kirby file. If if you look at what Jack was doing in '61, '62, like on the westerns and stuff, and then just go fast forward like three years later to '65 or '66, it's like something just exploded in Jack's mind. I mean, he went from just being a super talented artist to being the look of comics i mean he just took comics to the next level and uh, i i don't know what happened in jack's mind i mean because he was in his mid to late 40s it's not like he was a kid i mean all of a sudden he just must have said the hell with it i'm gonna do what i want and you know that's when galactus and the surfer and everybody came a morning uh and uh I guess Stan just kind of <laughs> stood aside in awe and let it happen. Uh, but uh, I, will be, I will be right back on there and change my shirt. Yeah, change your shirt. Uh oh, let's see what he's changing his shirt to. Hold on. <laughs> Look at that. That's a weird shirt. Look, he looks completely different now. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Welcome, Mr. Bill Morris, into the feed. Look at that. That was a good segue. Uh, hey, Mike. Hello, Bill. How are you? I'm doing okay. How about you? I'm doing okay as well. Thank you. Good, Good to see you. Yeah, I don't think we've ever uh, technically met. I mean, I know. Yeah, I know we weird. have a long, We've never. We've had. A, we have a long history, but I don't think we've ever. So, so you worked at Bongo for like 15 years, and, and Bill Morrison big league you, or you didn't even meet you. 
Yeah. Man. It's weird. Like, I, I know, Mike, you've heard lots of stories about uh, like writer artist teams or penciler inker teams that work together for years. And never met. And then they finally met like 40 years later at a comic convention or something. <laughs> and it's weird because people think, people think when they see someone's name on a Bongo comic that like those people all work there or at least come in, you know, drop their artwork off. Well, you were always, you were always in California back then, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's probably why we never met, but right. um, I will tell you now to his face that Bill was very instrumental, very encouraging. And, uh, without his help, I don't think I would have, uh, become part of the, uh, the Simpson gang there. So, uh, I'm telling you now to your face. I appreciate, <laughs> I appreciate well, it all the time. I, I, I was a big fan of yours and still am. So, you know, to me, it was, it was a coup to get you to actually work on our books. Well, uh, I'm sorry to see that Bongo kind of, you know, fell on some hard times, but yeah. Uh, you guys were always, uh, I see you, Mr. Williams. I'll, I'll answer that question in a second. <laughs> um, I, uh, you were all, uh, you were all good artists. And when you guys gave me um, critiques on something, I never felt it was arbitrary. I never felt it was just taste or preference. You were you were just about the most professional group of people that I ever dealt with. And, uh, you know, you, you, we, we didn't know any better. <laughs> <laughs> like, no, seriously, everybody at Bongo started in comics at Bongo. It's like none of us came from working under somebody else at another publisher. So when we started Bongo, we just had to figure it out. And I think we were all, you know, fairly nice people. So we all had the attitude that, you know, if we have to yell at somebody to do this job, then we don't want to do it because we're making comic books. Yeah. And so like that little inner 12 year old is like, this is, this is good. This is supposed to be the most fun job in the world. So if I have to feel bad doing this job, then, you know, I'm, I'm pissing on my childhood. <laughs> uh, so I think that was kind of the attitude we had and and we were I think we were professional because we did come from other like I came from advertising and um, illustration you know other people I think Terry Delagene was um, like he'd worked at Turner uh, Ted Turner's company and uh, you know I mean we're yeah we were all professional people um, but we didn't know that you were supposed to be a, an asshole <laughs> to work in comics <laughs> as, a, as an editor or a publisher. We didn't, had no idea. If somebody had told us that. The memo. Yeah, if somebody had told yeah. us that, we might have been real jerks, but we weren't. Yeah. <laughs> it, it took, it took, listen, it took Bill years to become an asshole. That's right. <laughs> and I earned it. <laughs> we have hey, to work hard at it. I'm going to. I'm going to be right back. Uh, my dog has to go out and take a whiz. So I'll be, uh, I'll be right back. Okay. There goes, there goes Satan's little helper right there. Out the door. I think we call that too much information, right? <laughs> well, now yeah. it gives you, it gives you a second to answer um, the, uh, uh, yes. the question. What do I think of digital inking? Uh, since I have done digital inking, I would be a fool to put it down. Um, I sort of stay away from it because the people who want my work, they want to physically hold a drawing in their hand, you know? So like I said, I, I learned all the illustrator means of inking. I learned all the Photoshop means of inking. I know there's many, many, other apps that you can uh do digital inking in but um no i don't have any problem with it uh 
you know, good art is good art. I mean, if you yeah. can produce good art with a toothpick, then that's fine, you know. Uh, well, that's, I, how, that's how David works now. He only works with toothpicks. Toothpicks. That's, that's his preferred way of method of drawing. Uh, now, here it know. comes. He's typing right now. <laughs> <laughs> now, David's great. David's, a, David's not only a friend, he's, he's one of our, our regular contributors. So uh, we're very, very I, uh, blessed with the amount of people that uh, have graced us with uh, being able to sell and, uh, and just talk to uh, them about their art. And uh, yeah, David's a great guy. Last, last year, I was actually at Renee Wittestatter's house and Michael Golden was there. And uh, he and I were talking about art and things like that. And it came up to the digital stuff. And I was like, yeah, I don't know why any artist would work digitally. You know, they, you know, they can't resell the artwork after they do the pages. You know, and I was sitting there bashing digital art. And Michael goes, yeah, I work pretty much digitally since uh, <laughs> 2000. I was like, uh, open mouth, insert foot. And uh, <laughs> that was the end of that. So <laughs> I have, I have known Michael for, 30, 35, 36 years. And uh, he is an inscrutable person. <laughs> he can be sweet as hell. He can be blunt and short. Uh, I love him to death, but he is not an easy person to, you know, to pierce. Yeah, uh, but uh, we we we've always had a, a. I mean, he's he's been at he was at my house many many times, um, and uh, back in Connecticut, we used to have uh, we used to we used to have a hell of a uh. Let me I'll sidetrack it. Does working digitally allow for quicker turnaround. I think it means a lot of artists do digital, like they don't have the physical copy to sell, but they do it because it allows them to do more stuff. So he's asking you, do you, do you agree that it's, it's like faster to do digital inks and physical inks because you can do a lot more quicker, you know, copying and pasting and blacking out and doing all that stuff, I guess. Yeah. Uh, I don't feel overly qualified to answer that because I'm a bit of a dinosaur. Uh, I, uh, I learned digital inking because I was working for uh, special projects for Disney and Marvel and DC and they all wanted, uh, first it was Photoshop, then it was Illustrator. Uh, so I learned those, but, uh, I, I hadn't had much cause to do, to do digital inking since. Um, I could still do it, but uh, I don't know. I, I just like the the feel of having something in my hand and working on paper. I don't know. Yeah. I'm the last of probably a dying breed, but. Uh, how did your dog, dog finish as Willie Bobo? And... <laughs> she was a good dog. She's good. <laughs> she did number one and number two. Oh, both. <laughs> this, is, this, is, this, is, this is all the extras you guys get. <laughs> With uh, roll. That's right. Hey, listen, if it, wasn't, if it wasn't for people who just work traditionally, then we wouldn't, we, Ken and I wouldn't even be, be in business here because we rely on the physical art. To, uh, to 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 I mean I, his his walls would all be full of prints instead of uh, pen and paper that uh, mm -hmm. someone put their hands on and actually uh, you know scribbled on so yeah so we're we're fans of the dinosaurs we're big dinosaur fans here sure and I am one I, I I caught the tail end of that Mike what you were saying about being the last of a dying breed and uh, we're in the same club I I have a Cintiq but I really use it for coloring pretty much. And that's about it. Yeah. I, I pretty much exclusively do coloring digitally. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I will hand color things if people want it, watercolor or, or whatever. But um, 
I mean, I, I, I can really, I showed uh, this piece before, you know, I, I can really make something look like a painting in Photoshop if I really want to, you know. Wow, that's great. Uh, so, um, I've got to, I was telling him I have to uh, meet Gal Gadot one day and show her that pinup and have her sign it for me. Uh, <laughs> one of my. Who's got her number? We can take her. You have her number? Everyone? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, goodness. Uh, but uh, Bill, what are you, uh, how are you occupying yourself these days, if I may ask? Uh, I well, I'm actually working on a Simpsons job for some toy packaging. And uh, I've, I've got a couple of minutes downtime just waiting on uh, color notes. And hopefully I get an approval tonight and then that one will be off my drawing board. But uh, I'm doing that, and I'm doing a job for Ahoy Comics and getting to work with uh, Gail Simone again. Gail, Gail's another Bongo alumnus. Um, a lot of people don't know this, but we actually gave Gail her first job in comics. Hmm. <laughs> um, no, she was, she was um, uh, doing hair. She was a hairdresser. And she was writing a column for the Comics Buyer's Guide called You'll All Be Sorry. And Scott Shaw was a big fan of it. And uh, I, I had read it as well, um, but I, I didn't make the connection. I, I enjoyed the column. It was funny and really well written, but I, I didn't think, oh, wow, she'd be a great writer for us. But Scott Shaw kept pestering me, and he's like, you got to call Gail Simone. She would be fantastic. You know, get her to write some stuff for you. So finally we did, and Gail was really hesitant. She was, you know, just kind of not, um, didn't have the confidence that, you know, she does now. And um, so it took us a while to get her to write something for us, but once she did, um, she was writing stories for Bart Simpson, and uh, she was writing our newspaper. We had a bongo, we had a, a Simpsons uh, newspaper comic strip, and she was writing that. And uh, before I knew it, suddenly she was doing stuff for DC, and then we couldn't get her on the phone anymore. <sighs> <laughs> Not really. She had, she did answer our calls, but she was. Um, you know, she got to be just too busy with the DC stuff. You know, you uh, you used a word that uh, I don't think people appreciate the way they should, and the word is confidence. Mm -hmm. Because uh, I think by nature, if you are trying to be in the creative field, and there are so many talented people, if you don't have an inner confidence and inner belief, it's just not going to work. Mm -hmm. And uh, oftentimes a person in their late teens, early 20s shows me their portfolio and what do you think my chances are? And, and, and I, I just tell them, I said, look, you got to believe in yourself. Believe in yourself, or nobody's going to believe in you. That's kind of trite, but if you if you don't think that you are worthy, why would anybody else? I'm sure somewhere in along along the lines of your late teens and early twenties, you were turned down for this or that. I know I was turned down, and you just have to have this belief that you know i'm worthy i i can do this if i if i keep at it and uh it's a hard thing to teach i don't know if you can teach it but i know you you must certainly know that and uh, yeah i think you have to be kind of raised with it um and i, I actually know some really excellent artists who gave up on 
becoming a professional because they they were raised with parents who were constantly telling them either um, you're not good enough or get a real job, get a real job, do something that's going to make you some money. You know, you can't play around with this comic book stuff or this art stuff. You know, it's not going to um, it's not going to pay off. And uh, if that gets hammered into you enough, um, when you're an adult, even though you don't maybe consciously think about it, that's still in the back of your head. Um, that that voice right. of your parent or your whatever your authority figure was that told you as a child you can't do this. You are going to you are going to be rejected in the business world. Sure. Uh, but you have to, you have to get past it. Um, you know, I, I was, uh, rejected many times, but I, you know, I didn't let that stop me. Uh, I just figured I needed to work harder. Mike, you continue to refine your style. Uh, it's a good question. Um, working with the Simpsons was one of the best disciplines I have ever incorporated because there was nary a wasted line and you were either spot on or it didn't look right, period. And uh, I have incorporated that into the rest of my life uh, and I've learned to, uh, I don't know if being a minimalist is the word, but, uh, I just want to make sure everything is really graphically sound, uh, light sources, geometry, composition, uh, because all the other noodling stuff, it's fine, but that doesn't make it that doesn't make a, a great piece of art anyway. It's the substructure, the composition, the design, the light source. Uh, I mean, I'm not telling you anything you don't know, but um, great discipline can be learned in the animation field because any, any wasted line sticks out like a sore thumb. Yeah. You know? And uh, the Simpsons, I, I'm going to say it again, they taught me a whole new level of discipline that at times was overwhelming. It was like, oh, my God, Jesus, I was off like one eyelash on Mars. And they made such a deal about it. <laughs> Get that it. Lisa's hair right. Yeah. And it's like, <laughs> but then, uh, you know, they, uh, I realized it was they wanted perfection and they trusted me to try to strive for it. And I appreciated it. You know, it, uh, it, it made me work harder. It, yeah. Those, those characters are very deceptive because they look, they look very simple. Um, you know, the colors are flat. Um, exactly. So that, that kind of, makes you think oh they're just flat two-dimensional characters but when you talk about lighting and everything um it's really true i mean they're very dimensional they're very they're based on geometric shapes it's all pure yeah if i do a little talk at a middle school or a high school i'll have a, a, a big sheet of paper and i invariably do a homer simpson and i will Start with a sphere and then a circle and another circle and some triangles and and uh, all of a sudden people are, are like, oh my God, that's Homer Simpson. <laughs> yes. It's all geometry. Yeah. It's all geometry. Homer Simpson is a magnificent collection of spheres and triangles and and shapes and cones and you know it's all geometry and uh it's it's funny because they they just see you doing these 
it looks like random quick sketches, but then all of a sudden they're like, that's Homer Simpson. <laughs> you know? I said, I know that that's all it is. Yeah. It's, it's geometry. That's yeah. all Homer is. He's a beautiful collection of geometric shapes that interrelate. I've done, I've done talks like that for um, elementary school kids and the teachers love it because, you know, inevitably you're, you are talking about geometric shapes and geometry when you're showing the kids how to draw these characters. And I always, I always sort of take the opportunity to say, so, you know, kids, when you're studying math, you got to pay attention because that all plays into drawing these characters and not just these characters, but, you know, if I'm drawing a bowl of fruit, I'm drawing geometric shapes and breaking it down before I start rendering it and, and making an apple look like an apple or a banana look like a banana. And you can see the teachers who are standing off in the back of the classroom, you can see them smile because that gives them something later when the kids are goofing off at, you know, during math lessons. Because I remember what Bill Morrison said about geometry, you gotta pay attention. <laughs> well, I, uh, I used to do private tutoring and I used to like, I used to get a, a, a little kick out of scaring the crap out of the students at first. And I said, uh, I would say, how do you feel about geometry and trigonometry? And like, Bleh. I said, well, I said, that's really what drawing is. It's geometric shapes placed into a trigonometric field. I said, it's, yes, creativity and everything else comes into play, but so much of art is mathematics. And I said, I'm no lover of math. I mean, uh, you know, but that's what it is. And when you show them how it all relates, uh, you know, depth of field and, and, and you know, Respective. the perspectives and everything, then, you know, you see that light bulb go off. It's like, hey, I can learn and use math and be creative and have fun. And, you know, uh, it takes it takes the mystery because people think that we have something magical going on. And all right, maybe we were blessed with something. But you know, there's just so much behind, there's so much study, classical study behind it. And if you can just get people to relax about it and incorporate it, you know, the, 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 the mystery is, is gone. They relax and they realize, yeah, not everybody can be Jack Kirby. Not everybody can be Joe Kubert. Not everybody can be Garcia Lopez. But almost anybody can learn to do very competent artwork. If you just showed the proper, proper things. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, kind of blabbing on here, but uh, I, was at a, I was at a con with, with Bill and he was doing, um, he was doing quick sketches of the Simpsons. And as I was watching him do these, I noticed he always started with the ear. And I was trying to figure out why, you know, so, but then I finally had to ask him why. And then he told me that that centers the head, you know, then he knows how high to go with the head and how low to go. And it's like a, it's like an anchor point. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that's and that's when I'm doing, like, if I'm just doing a Sharpie drawing and I'm not sketching it out first. Right. That's how I do it. Like, for some reason, I start with the ear. And I know the relationship between the ear and the eye, both in size and distance. Um, so I can draw the ear and then I can put that first eye where it's supposed to go and make it the right size. And then I can put that second eye where it's supposed to go. Kind of I know where the nose goes. goes because the bottom of the nose is centered on the. Sadly, I sadly I know exactly what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah, he, he's not exaggerating at all. Yeah. I mean, it's really it, it now, comes down to that. When I when I'm sketching, 
you know, with a pencil, like if I was doing a job or doing a, um, not just a quick marker sketch, but a commission, I would draw a circle first for the head or, you know, in the case of Homer, I would do the circle for the, for his dome and then, you know, draw, draw what's below it. Um, so it's, so it's weird. I, it's, I never used to do that until my first signing with uh, Matt Groening, the first Simpsons comic signing. And I thought we were just going to be signing comic books. And then suddenly Matt sitting next to me, he was like a surprise guest at the first one. He, he was, he was not announced and he decided to come and suddenly like word got out and we had a line around the block and all these people, Matt started doing sketches and I'm standing there with Steve Vance and we're, we're both going, okay, well, we got to keep up. So we had to like figure out how to draw those characters, you know, without sketching with a pencil, but just going, you know, straight from, from ink. Um, but, you know, you sort of, it, you just sort of figure out how to do it. Um, and what feels right. And for me, the ear was the, the key. I don't know why. That makes sense. That yeah. makes sense. Hey, these uh, novitiates didn't know how famous Matt's father was. In oh, the, yeah? In the advertising field. Uh-huh. Yeah, Homer Grading. When, yeah. uh, when we started working on Futurama on the show, uh, Matt brought me over to his studio a couple of days a week from Bongo. And uh, <clears throat> we started working on the Futurama character designs together. And he had all these film canisters piled up in one room in, the, in his, he had a studio that had like four or five rooms. And uh, I asked him what these films were. And he says, oh, those are my dad's films. Um, and uh, he said, you know, he was an artist and a filmmaker and musician. So he started telling me all about his dad. And if um, if anybody remembers the Curiosity Company on-screen logo, um, like at the end of a Futurama episode, you'll see it says, there's like a rectangle and it says Curiosity Company. And there's like, there's like a close up on some water and um, it's like ripples in the water. That was from one of his dad's films. No kidding. Yeah. Wow. So his dad would do these like very artistic, you know, experimental films. Um, do they ever have plans of doing another Simpson movie? What I always heard was that once the show is finally canceled, um, that's what they're going to focus on. But when they did the first Simpsons movie back in 2007, I think everybody agreed that it was impossible to do a movie and a season of shows at the same time without hiring a whole different staff of people. Mm -hmm. And they didn't want to, they didn't want to have like a group that just did the movies and another group that just did the TV shows. They wanted it to be the, the same crew. Right. So I think they all kind of agreed once the show is done, then we'll see about doing some more movies. Yeah, Cause that was, uh, I think that was one of the best animated movies I've ever seen. It was, I don't know if, if anybody caught uh, a couple of weeks ago, there was a, a, an hour long, I don't know if they showed it on one night or if they split it up. Um, but I, I saw it as as one hour long um, episode because I did a poster for it. They wanted to have a, a poster to advertise it. Mm -hmm. So they, they sent me a link and I got to see it in advance. So when I saw it, it was all one long, long episode. But I heard um, somebody said it was a two-parter. They referred to it that way. Uh -huh. Anyway, I don't know how people saw it, but it was... Um, it was a little like a Trias of Horror episode in that um, people die in it. So there's no continuity with the show. Oh. Um, 
you know, so it's like characters that you know are coming back actually die in this episode. Um, but it, it's sort of based on Fargo on the TV show. Hmm. And it's called A Serious Flanders. <laughs> and it's it's this crime crime drama um, set in a Springfield that looks very much like it's always winter. Cool. You know what Fargo is, how it's just like always snowing. Um, and Flanders finds this bag of money and it leads, it leads into this whole, um, thing with a flashback to his, his grandfather. And, um, I don't want, I don't want to give any spoilers, but when I saw it, I, I told, um, the producer who would, um, assigned me the job of doing the poster. I said, I said, this is so good. I mean, it feels very much like a movie. And I feel like if the show ever does actually end, you guys, you guys could just use this as a way to pitch a series of movies. You get just, that. just use this hour long episode and say, you know, add a half hour to this and we've got a great movie. If you get Steve Buscemi to do a, a guest, a guest <laughs> voice there, get the voiceover. Yeah, they should have. Um, although I guess it wasn't based on the movie; it was based on the Fargo show. So, um, and there were there were some guest voices on it, but I don't know if they had any relation to the Fargo Netflix series. Did you see that Disney short that's out on uh, Disney Plus? Uh, which the one? Simpsons, where they go into Moe's Tavern to meet all the Disney characters. Oh no, I haven't seen that. No. Yeah. I saw well, I saw a um, a still that I thought was something a fan did. It had Homer drinking with Goofy. Is that what yeah, that's that's that's, that's right. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. It, it, it starts out like you know you, they're going into Moe's, and you know it's got the, the the partitions there, and the the two people guarding the door are Wreck It Ralph, and uh, I forget <laughs> who the other one is. <laughs> But yeah, so there's all Disney characters in there, and oh, okay, I'm gonna watch that tonight. Yeah, it's one of those ones. It's only like three or four minutes long, you know. Uh, it's a yeah. quick hitter, but yeah, they seem to be doing those shorts a lot on uh, yeah. Disney Plus. Um, um, but yeah, anyway, I I think the ideas for movies could be limitless. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, uh, and the and the cool thing about this episode, I, I, I did really love, I mean, I've always loved Trials of Horror episodes. And they were obviously not connected to the regular continuity of the show. Um, and I, and I, love, I love that because, um, like, if a character is uh, uncharacteristically evil or a character dies, you don't expect it. You know, it just kind of comes out of nowhere. Mm -hmm. um, so it makes for, you know, kind of an entertaining viewing experience because you don't know what's coming next. And with the regular TV show, you know, it's been around for 30 years, so you pretty much know what's coming. <laughs> you know, there aren't, I mean, there are surprises, but there's there's not a lot of surprises. But with something like this, you could do anything. You know, you could do a space adventure, you could do a horror well, they do the horror with Jazz of Horror, but um, you, you know, you could you could tackle any genre and do whatever you want with the characters and and have a great movie. Did you uh, did you find Matt an easy person to work with? Uh, oh yeah, yeah. He seems like an easygoing type of guy. I'm sure he's a perfectionist, but still. he's he's a perfectionist. Um, he's really good at. Uh, gathering, kind of like Walt Disney was really good at gathering people around him that he trusted and, and he knew what they could do. He knew what their abilities were, but he also knew that he could push them further than they thought they could go, yeah. which was really the case for me, with me, because I never dreamed I would be a writer. I never dreamed I'd be, you know, an editor or kind of running a company like that. And Matt was the one that gave me that opportunity. Um, That's great. Yeah. And, and he, so he was very supportive. Um, there were a few times when he came down to my office 
And uh, I mean, at one point he got like early on, he would look at everything before it went to the printer. But once, once he was doing the Simpsons and Futurama and working on ideas for other things and still doing life in hell, his time was really limited. So it got to the point where he wouldn't, and, and it also was a point at which he, he really trusted us. Sure. So he didn't feel the need to look at everything before it went out the door. And I can think of like maybe two times when he came down to my office holding the latest issue of whatever title it was and told me never to do something again. He'd say, see this here? Don't ever do this again. <laughs> <laughs> but he was really nice about it. You know, like he'd say, uh, you know, like I remember doing this one Bart Simpson cover that was based on um, a uh, James Bond poster. The one where you're looking through James Bond's legs at the, the I think it's a girl with a gun. Oh, no, you're looking at the female legs. <laughs> yeah. And James Bond's like way in the distance with a gun. So it was a, it was an issue that kind of featured Lisa heavily in the story. So I did like a close up on Lisa's legs. You kind of saw the bottom of her skirt and her legs. And then way in the distance where James Bond would be was Bart with a slingshot. And he came into my office and he goes, um, Is this, was this your idea? And I, I didn't know if he was going to praise me or condemn me. So I said, yeah. And um, he said, uh, you know, don't, don't do something like this because it's weird. You know, Bart's like aiming the slingshot up Lisa's dress. And I didn't really see it that way because I, you know, he was so far in the distance. I just saw it as Bart aiming the slingshot at Lisa. You were doing an homage, but yeah. Yeah, he didn't. Um, yeah. But once he pointed it out, it was kind of like, oh, yeah, that's a little creepy. Um, so, you know, there were, like I said, there were like maybe two or three times when, when he had to do that. But most of the time he was, um, he was always happy with what we did and always praised it. And, uh, you know, if he had, if he had some downtime, he would come down to my office and just talk about comics. Um, yeah, he was fun, fun to, fun to work with. Yeah. I don't, I, don't, uh, I know very, very little about Matt. I, I was never, uh, I was never in California with you guys. So, uh, I never met him or anything, but, uh, that's interesting. I, I had a feeling he was uh, a pretty agreeable person to work with. Tone um, Rodriguez, I don't know if you know Tone, um, but he he always tells this story about the first time he met Matt. He came to the Bongo offices and, you know, he said, so if I see, he says, Matt's office is here, right? And I said, yeah, he's here right now. And he said, well, you know, if, if I see him, should I talk to him? Is it okay to talk to him? And I said, yeah, of course. And he goes, well, I don't know. You know, like some, some people who are like at that level, they don't want, right. you know, the peons to, to even look him in the eye, you know, make eye contact. And I said, no, no, Matt's a regular guy. You know, just if you want to talk to him, talk to him. So Tone had this like 1970s van that was, um, I don't remember, it, it didn't have like imagery on the side, but it had like airbrushing, like pinstriping and airbrushing. And it was really kind of cool looking, but but kind of old and, and a little beat up. And he had parked it in front of Bongo, like right in front of the front door. And there was a, a meter out there and he remembered that he needed to feed the meter. So he went to go do that. And Matt was standing at the door like looking out the door at the van and he was just kind of, you know, expressionless, just kind of staring at the van and, you know, tone kind of came up and he said, Oh, excuse me. I got to feed the meter. And Matt goes, is that your van? And tone couldn't read him, you know, like he, 
he couldn't All tell right. if he was pissed or he was delighted or what. And he, he goes, yeah, yeah, I'm really sorry. You know, I didn't mean to, you know, I hope it's not in a bad place. Uh, I can move it if you want. And Mac goes, no, it's really cool. Can I, can I go in it? <laughs> okay. I'm like, yeah, sure. So they go out and he opens up the, the van and Mac gets in. He's like, wow, this is really cool. You know, and he's just kind of like geeking out on this old van. And, um, you know, that was the moment where Tone just kind of relaxed and he's like, oh, he's a regular guy, you know, you relate to him. I didn't and even he, have to offer him any candy to get in my van or anything. He just wanted to get in. <laughs> and then Grady walked into the offices and turned and said, release the hounds. Yeah. <laughs> hey, guys, I got to go. My wife needs me to climb up a ladder and help her with something. <laughs> Don't fall off the ladder. I can't make any promises. Yeah, you do cold, it, You got snow up there, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah you don't it's, want to fall. It's inside, though. It's in. It's in indoors. <laughs> well, well it, was, uh, it was. I guess nice meeting you. Yeah, you too. Well, right? <laughs> uh, you know, I think Kirby and Sinnott didn't meet until 1975 or six. Yeah, that. I had heard that. Uh, not that uh, we're Kirby Senate, but anyway. <laughs> oh, that's right. That's a, that's exactly what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you're I'm Kirby Senate, right? <laughs> uh, but anyway, it was nice to meet you, and you really were uh, of great help to me. Oh, thank you. That, that makes me smile. Thanks, Mike. Okay, pal. Hey, thanks have for a coming on, Bill. Thanks, guys. Talk to you soon. Yeah, we'll see you. All right, buddy. Have a great one. Thanks. <laughs> Take care. Bye. Yeah, sorry. I had yeah. this. I, that's, he's a great guy. I had to step away for a couple minutes, and I, when, I, when I was kind of ready to come back on, there was no – I didn't even need to come back on. You guys were having some great conversations. <laughs> yeah, I didn't uh, – you know, I had never been out to their California studios, so uh, – you know, we always worked through FedEx or whatever. I would uh, download their files and print them out. So uh, I didn't really know any of those guys personally. So, uh, I mean, Bill now I've known for at least 20 years, but I, I've never really met him before. So it was nice. Yeah. But, yeah, Bill uh, and I have talked, and he mentioned that you, you know, you did a lot of inking work for Bongo, and I said, "Well, if I ever have him back on, I'll have to have him come on." So I asked him to come on tonight. And, uh, yeah, no, it was. It was very nice to see him. Um, if I may be somewhat honest, uh, I have yet to eat today. Sure. <laughs> no, we're good. Yeah, so, no, no, you can. Yeah, you can. You can, if you're ready to take off, buddy, you go ahead and get some food in you. Yeah, uh, I just mine down earlier. <laughs> it's been it's been a long day, and uh, but we'll, uh, we're gonna, probably going to open up some sort of commission list for everybody for for Mike. We'll get that announced for you tomorrow. So yeah. everybody who's looking to get a sketch from him, we'll we'll have the information can, for you guys tomorrow. Absolutely, you can you can um, you can break it down into gee, I really would like this for a Christmas present, or. When he gets to it, he gets to it. I mean, I will go out of my way to try to get some stuff done if somebody wants to make it a Christmas present for somebody. Mm -hmm. uh, then now that being said, if you really don't want to give this as a Christmas present, please don't pipe that in there. Because otherwise, he's going to have to try and do like 50 like in like the next week. So you we don't want to put him through that. But but if you do uh, want it, then I mean, uh, especially if they're just, you know, bus shots or single figures. Uh, Stephen Curtis, I know that fella. <laughs> yeah, it's 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 probably two o'clock in the morning where he is right now. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, I guess they're what about five hours. Uh, yeah, uh, must, like yeah. Uh, I would like to request Ink Warlord with Wayne or Joseph. You got it, pal. Yeah, well, we'll put you on the list, buddy. You're on the list. I, uh, he's the one who, uh, that's who I did Tom Strong for. Oh, yeah. That was, we were looking at that one backstage earlier, Stephen. That's gorgeous, man. 
Congratulations. Yeah, and I got another one that he wants me to do too. Uh, but uh, anyway, I uh, I very much appreciate you guys having me on again. Well, thank you for coming on again. Absolutely. And, uh, one of the few things that I don't get tired of talking about is art and comics and uh, the people I've met and known and who have influenced me. And uh, you're welcome, Stephen. Uh, we should get you on with Jim Shooter. It'd be like a six hour show. <laughs> Jim and I get along so well. It, it's, oh, he's great. I love that guy. I mean, I, I used to hear all these things. Oh, <clears throat> Jim Shooter. I don't know. We just hit it off. We, we, we I get along great with Jim. I don't I'm the same him. way. I get along real. I get along great with Jim. He's awesome. Oh yeah, he's a, he's a, he's he's always been super gracious and and, uh, and wonderful with us. So mm -hmm. you know, maybe I, it was different when you had to work for him back in the day. I don't know, but yeah, I don't know. He, uh, I guess, if you're not, uh, I think so, I think people really appreciate if you're not a bullshitter, if I can be so blunt. Sure. And uh, I'm not one. And uh, I I think people appreciate that about me. Um, and I know Jim is not one. So, you know, we, we could just talk immediately and not have to worry about every word we're saying. He would tell me all these terrible stories about Gil Kane. <laughs> and uh, it was funny. Uh, stuff I won't, I won't repeat. Not, not about his talent, but uh, about that he was not the easiest guy to deal with. But uh, I will leave that to the discretion of Mr. Shooter if you ever talk <laughs> about Gil Kane. I'm going to write it down right now to ask him about next time he's on. Well, Gil, Gil has since passed, so we'll, uh, right. you know, we'll let him rest in peace for his great abilities. But uh, anyway, fellas, uh, Ken, you know, you can email me anytime with whatever mm -hmm. lists that you may have. And as I say, I will make an effort to fit stuff in for Christmas if people want. We're I guess tomorrow's December first, so mm -hmm. wouldn't be too too difficult. But uh, anyway, thank you, gentlemen. Again, I will uh, go throw something down my gullet there and, and <laughs> rest my shoulder. And Absolutely. Day. So uh, you take care and thank you for having me on again. Appreciate Bye. it, Mike. Thanks for coming Thanks on, buddy. Mike, man, we, we loved having you, sir. Talk you soon. Ready? Okay. Absolutely. Take care. All right. Take care. Yeah. Oh, that and then there cool. were two. Yeah, that was uh, that was the great uh, Mike DiCarlo. So I'm glad you guys all got to hear all those conversations. I know I, I ended up having to step out for a minute, and then I didn't even need to step back on with with Bill here. That, that, that was those were some great conversations going on. So I hope you guys enjoyed that little peek behind the scenes of uh, what goes on at Bongo and and other more great stories from Bill. And we're hoping we're going to open up a new commission list for Bill at some point here. <laughs> fairly soon so probably probably begin beginning of next year i would imagine uh yeah <clears throat> probably yeah we, we we can we can go over some a little bit of news we have Anything? sure well let me before we get to the news i want to make sure that i let people know there's still um there's still about two or three spots left on the craig hamilton sketch list which i'm going to close this week so if you want to get in on that craig told me he wants to get all these pieces to everybody before christmas so if you wanted something and from Craig him, is watching, I believe, or was. Yeah, yeah, he was in the chat. So if you guys want something, uh, check out the 4C page and you can see the prices and, and, the op and the options there and a couple of examples of his work. And he's already hard to work on some. And and uh, we'd love to add some more people to the list, but he's, it's only a limit of, uh, there's only seven people on the list and he, he opened up an extra spot. So, uh, and then th there's already four spots taken. So we have three spots left. So if you want that, he's, he's, tr he's trying to get them all done and wants to get them out before Christmas, so. Ken nothing. Jeff's running this one. Mm -hmm. He said, "Ken, you got me down on that." List. I said, "Jeff, Ken nothing. Jeff is running this list." Listen, you will just, just just listen. Go on the if, if you're on the just go on to the, uh, the the Craig Hamilton post on the 4C page and type claim and tell me the size. If you want a full figure or torso, every single one is going to be in color pencils. He does incredible work, and uh, and just pick one and let me know because I'll get him started on it tonight. 
uh, I'll, I'll put you down the list. He, he's, he wants to know. He was after me today. He's like, who else? Who else? Who else? So, you know, just let me know. And, he, and he's killing these things, man. He really is. He's working hard. And he's doing a great job. So, yeah, if you want to get in on that, get in on that. And uh, after that, I'll leave the new news to uh, Ken. Well, I'm going to start off with um, some a little bit of bad news. For those who, for those that care, anyway, it's not, it's not, uh, it's not our fault. The uh, the four COA thing is kaput as of right now. The printer died on me. Um, I have to send it out for repairs, so four COAs are going to be paused for a bit. Um, anybody who ordered a four COA over the weekend or anything like that, um, I'll give you two choices. I can either just give you your money back, or we can just hold on to it until. A later date when I actually get this thing up and running, it, but it's going to be—it's probably going to be a few months. Uh, yeah, they fix the, it to send it back to the company, and they've got to yeah. keep going with it and send it back. These things cost a lot of money. We're not just going to go out and buy another one. So, yeah, but this yeah, is it was a very expensive machine, and, and it's broken. So, um, troubleshooted it the best I could. I actually, had to send a video into them, and they said, "Yeah, no, would you got to send that to us?" So, um, so the four COA things are are, are are on hold for right now. Um, we're working on some great stuff. I mean, um, there's a possible live sketch up that's going to be coming up hopefully soon. It's going to blow your doors off. Yep. Literally. I mean, Big bad. You guys, have been, you guys have been begging for it. Let's just put it that way. Mm -hmm. the, 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 uh, a unicorn is coming to town. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Absolutely. So we'll we'll yeah. see if it comes to fruition. I think it will. Um, yeah. And really for anybody, nice. and we're gonna, we've got all those posts we made for, um, for the weekend, for for Black Friday, for uh, Small Business Saturday, for you know uh, Cyber Monday, all that stuff is gonna be up for the rest of the week. And then we're gonna, we don't want to clutter the page, so we're, you know, we're gonna pull some of that stuff down too. So yeah, I already pulled some of it down already. Yeah. So if anybody wants any last minute stuff, like we just sold the, uh, the Frank Miller electric piece is gone. That was up there. We still have a, a Frank Miller Batman sketch. There's mm -hmm. all kinds of another Batman. It's really inexpensive by Marlon Shoup. There's some, some cool Buffy, the vampire slayer sketches at very reasonable prices. I don't know if anybody collects that stuff, but it's, they're really cool by some, some really great, uh, uh artists that, uh, unfortunately some of them, we don't know who they are because they were done. Uh, I want to say like 15 years ago or something, but, um, but yeah, and, like, hey, that's, that's Steve Curtis, you still in the room? Let me know if you're still in the chat, Steve. Okay. Um, but anyway, yeah. But uh, Ken's going to start figuring and anything we haven't invoiced already. Ken's going to work on invoicing. He mailed a whole bunch of stuff today. I saw him packing stuff up all day. Steven's here. What do you want to say to Steven? Steven, do you, do you, since we're doing stuff, I mean, would you like to see your Ron Wilson cover recreation? Oh, oh I see what you did there. Because yeah. we got all the Ron Wilson cover recreations in yesterday jeff yeah. drove up to baltimore picked them up mm -hmm. and he's going to drive them down to florida and that's service i tell you what i'm driving these all that's the way to just for you guys has nothing to do with the fact that my daughter and i are going to orlando to that's go to uh, universal studios i'm just driving them down to bring you trip was so to bring down ron wilson art that's yeah. the trip exactly he but said he would work. like to see it jeff if you have it if you have it nearby well, which which one was stevens you guys tell me which ones which one uh, his was uh his was this thing in sandman the thing in San oh, oh, that's right. Okay, hold on. It's you know, I wish you'd gotten with me a little bit sooner before you said that, Ken, because it's downstairs. But I got mine. I got my Ron Wilson piece. <laughs> Check that out. That is a Shang Chi master of kung fu. Look at that bad boy, huh? That's doesn't get better than that, man. That's mine. Oh, Steven, you don't you haven't seen nothing yet, man. <laughs> <laughs> that's just, that's just and that's just a character on a page. Ken, you got you got a riff for a minute because I got it downstairs. Yeah, I yeah, I, I got something to talk about, so I'm good. Um, we are literally, hopefully, days away from possibly launching the 4C website. Yeah. Um, oh, it looks so good. I'll be right back. Yeah, uh, one of one of the 4C members, uh, JC Washburn, he he did the site. Um, it's fantastic. Um, he did give me editorial ability today. Uh, unfortunately, I'm technologically uh, handicapped, so um, I tried to do it, but I couldn't figure it out. Um, but I'm going to try again. If I can figure it out, you know, we're probably going to launch the page. And when we launch the page, the page is going to be full of art. 
It's going to be full of, you know, commission ops, all the news about 4C, everything. So that'll really be the hub for everything that's going on. Um, we'll still, we're still going to obviously do everything on the Facebook group and everything like that. But we also want to have another venue or another avenue for people to purchase things and, and, and do check on sketch ops that, cause you know, the thing on Facebook is, you know, I might have a sketch up up there that's open for two weeks, but it gets buried in a bunch of other posts. So if we get everybody um, used to the idea to go to the 4C site, check out to see what commission ops are open. Um, that'll be the plan. And obviously I can put up all the art that I have. I mean, you know, I have a tremendous amount of David Williams art. I've got a lot of Bill Morrison stuff and, you know, more stuff's coming. So, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. This is, this is uh, one of the, uh, one. Of, so anybody who is interested, Ron Wilson, we did a commission list with Ron Wilson where he did just so cover cool. recreations of only covers he did. This is something we're probably going to do again at some point. And this was one that Mr. Uh, Stephen Curtis already, this is an actual cover from The Thing and Sandman sitting at a bar. It's a European cover that Ron did. Look at that, Stephen. I mean, he just did an amazing job. Yeah. Yeah, I think that said it right there. Look at that. So, yeah. If you want to screenshot it, here you can screenshot it. I'll put it in. <laughs> take that down. In the there you go. Let me, let me take down the comments. This way you can get everything. If you want to screenshot that, buddy, you can screenshot that and you can rotate there you it. Go. There we go. All right. Okay. Uh huh. All right. <laughs> All right, so, Ken, I can't pull any more of these out. I got them all packed up for the trip. And, I mean, nah, I, I'm not going to ask you. I just wanted to show one. You just I knew Stephen was in the room, so I could ask him if it was okay to show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but yeah, um, and there's other creators that are that are considering doing this, one being Bill Morrison. He wants to do cover recreations. So, you know, you might want to start looking through your Bungo comics to see which one you want to get. Uh, Jeff is yeah. messed up. Dude, listen, 4C, we believe in masks. We believe in getting vaccinated. We believe in getting booster shots. I said it. I say it every episode. Please go out and get your booster shot. We are not gonna, we're not gonna take this this Omicron lying down. We're just gonna we're gonna keep beating it back. So mm -hmm. um, and we want to see people in New Orleans and we want to see people in whatever show we're doing after that. Yeah. Uh, uh, Philadelphia or yeah. Cleveland or something. <laughs> We got like April, May, June, July. God willing, if they ever announce the dates for 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 uh, San Diego Comic Con, we're planning on doing that one this year. They're not going to. We're not canceling that one three years in a row. Darn it! Well, they just had the one this weekend. I don't know how it went. Um, haven't heard a word from Annika. So either she's in a post con uh, comatose or uh, yeah. She's probably in recovery mode. She, I mean, that apparently that was a great show to be at if you wanted to get art. It was at a San Diego Comic Con because the crowds were so small because it was the sort of a you know a minor you know show versus the major one. So yeah, she yeah. may have gotten stuff. She may she may be out of money. She might have had to sell her apartment or something to pay for all that art. I don't know. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, other than that, I mean, just you know, quick up. David Williams is uh, he did all the non-color commissions. He's working on the color commissions now. Mm -hmm. uh, Bill Morrison is still working through the list. He, I know he did two of the pieces that were owed this week. Yep. Um, who else? Who else? Who else? Who else? Who else? Who else? Well, you mailed out all the he, all the Craig Hamilton stuff is uh, is going out. It's all it's all. Uh, uh, it's it's it's, it's ready to go. I haven't I yeah. haven't I haven't printed the uh, labels yet, but. Right. They're going out. Um, yeah, I, yeah. What, what, I don't even know what I was shipping. I got a ton of stuff that's going out. Um, too much, a lot of stuff. I don't even know what's going out. And a lot of the mystery envelopes are all pretty much all packed up, ready mm -hmm. to go. Um, anything I was bought this weekend, uh, I'm working on getting it all sorted out. Um, yeah, yeah. So everything's everything's rocking and rolling, guys. I mean, we're Jason, we're, Jason we're pumping the brakes a little bit for the next few weeks. Yeah. Hey, um, listen, can can throw that comment from Jason J Jason Harris up there. Yeah, he's the only one watching on YouTube. Why aren't you guys watching on YouTube? We, we need we need you to join the YouTube. Come on, watch on the YouTube. We love that you watch us on Facebook. We love that you watch us at all, but we want to get you all over to the YouTube. We might even do a special op coming up. This unicorn op. We might even do it just for Facebook users. I mean, not only Facebook. Fa yeah, we might. We we're thinking about throwing it out there. For YouTube this op which is going to be for 
any it's going to be we'll broadcast it on all the platforms we do now yes. but it will only be claims accepted for youtube subscribers yes we need and your that's it and so if you're not a youtube subscriber and you throw a claim out there and i look it up i'm gonna say nope sorry Next. Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna sound like all those other guys, you know. So subscribe and hit the like button. That's we don't we don't want to have to say that. We want you guys just to do it. So please subscribe and hit the like button. That's it. So I don't want to ever say that again. Done. Yeah. Please do that. <laughs> and Jason, that's fine. You, as long as you subscribe to the YouTube channel and and uh, you can watch on Facebook all you want. But you know, YouTube YouTube is gonna help help force you grow. You know, if we can get it to thousand subscribers. That helps us, you know, it opens up our, the algorithms. We start becoming, you know, more widely seen. And then we can bring more bigger, better, beautiful ops to you guys. Yeah. Uh, and we're, we're, we're going to start, we're going to start changing things a little up. You know, we're still going to always try to always have a Tuesday show, but it might not, not always be a sketch op show. Kind of like what we're doing lately. You know, we don't want to, we don't want to constantly just throw anything at you guys. You know, we want to make them quality. Um, so. Um, but we might do things like, you know, news, we might do, we might do interviews. Um, you know, we, we might open up to, you know, writers and things like that. We can have them on and just do interview sections. We might have do like we did tonight where we have creators on yeah. and have, let them have conversations together. So, um, uh, you know, if, if you help, if you help us build it, it'll you. get better. Yeah. Listen. Guys, all we want to do is keep bringing you bigger and better stuff and, and and joining the YouTube and subscribing is another way. If we can get as many followers on there as we have on Facebook, you know, we can get even more and more and more. And it just it just builds that the algorithm kicks in. People start looking up comic book artwork on YouTube and our channel pops up and then we get more people to join. And then we get, you know, more and more bigger, better ops. And it just keeps getting bigger and bigger. And, you know, until and, and, and and then Ken like, won't take your phone calls anymore. No, I'm just kidding. Exactly. Ken won't work. And we're not, we're not like a lot of other companies, you know, we are not, we're not an island, you know, we feel we're, 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 we're Sweden, I guess, or Switzerland, where we want to branch out. If you, if, if other places are willing to work with us, we're going to work with them. Listen, you know? it, like, like, you know, like Clan McDonald, like, you know, just put a post out that says, you know, there can be only one. We don't believe that. We, we believe there can be 50. There can be a hundred. We can all, we can all make this better for all the art fans. And, uh, and we're I'd, not, I'd, yeah, I'd rather be a spoke in a wheel than, you know, isolated. Like, you know, that's just the way I look at it. Yeah. And I say it's tongue in cheek because, because everybody, Stephen, uh, Stephen, oh, I love Stephen. Great, he's a great guy. He's a great friend. He made that post trying to push up his own site and you can't sure. be doing that, but we want to, you know, we, we're not, that's not what we're, that's not what we're about. We want, we want to push up everybody's sites. And if, you know, and, and yeah. Stephen being a guy we want to work with. Yeah, so. exactly. <laughs> he's, and he's actually approached us and said, if there's anything yeah. we want to team up on. Yeah, absolutely. You know what's you know the tide raises all ships, so we just want to get the tide to roll in. So let's mm -hmm. do it. Yep. So we appreciate everybody out there. We did get to a thousand, obviously. Um, and not only that, but over a thousand. Yeah, we're now one point one. Yeah, we're growing. Yeah, and growing. So it keeps growing and growing, and uh, yeah, we really appreciate it. Uh, I don't know what we're going to have next week, but um, we'll do a show definitely. Whether it's just us sitting here, maybe an art drop of some sort, maybe a creator is going to come on. Who knows? Um, but always tune in to us at 7.30 on Tuesdays. We're going to be here for you guys. Absolutely. We possibly can. Yeah, definitely. And like I said, we understand that the Christmas is coming closer and we've done our, our sales stuff for you. We have a few things left. If you want to jump on any of that stuff, please get on the Facebook page. And if you want to get any of that stuff, get it now so we can get it shipped out so we can get it to you by Christmas. Other than that, yeah, we're, we're, we're not going to be super heavy on, on, on products and ops for the next, you know, as soon as we have one, we'll announce it, but we're going to probably – probably going to be after Christmas just because we want to make sure that, uh, you know, we, you guys, we know we have other places to spend your money. You got family, you got stuff to do, you got vacations yeah. and trips and stuff. So we're, we don't want you to miss out on anything and we don't want you to have to choose between, you know, something like art and, you know, buying Christmas presents for friends or something. So we're, we're, you know, we're, we'll be here. We're always here for your entertainment. Uh, hopefully you're entertained. Um, and, uh, yeah. And there's no memes tonight. Can we got to do a new meme? I, I want that. Uh, I want that. Are you not entertained? As a meme. I mean, <laughs> All right, I'll see if I can find it. Yeah, we'll do that one. And pull it down. But yeah, thanks everybody for coming out tonight. Really appreciate it. Thanks to Mike and Bill for uh, hanging out with us. Absolutely. Of course. Jeff, as always, thank you, my friend. Oh no, thank you, buddy. That's uh, like I said, it's always uh, it's always a pleasure. So you guys all have a wonderful night, and remember, yes, please, please get vaccinated, get boosters, uh, and uh, let's beat this uh, this beat this coronavirus down so we can get back to normal. So uh, thank you guys all for tuning in, and we'll see you next Tuesday. Have a wonderful night. Take care.